Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 2 of The Revolt of the Angels by Anatole France, wherein useful information will be found concerning a library where strange things will shortly come to pass. Desirous of embracing the whole circle of human knowledge, and anxious to bequeath to the world a concrete symbol of his encyclopedic genius and a display in keeping with his pecuniary resources. Baron Alexandre d'Esparvieux had formed a library of 360,000 volumes, both printed and in manuscript, whereof the greater part emanated from the Benedictines of Ligogé. By a special clause in his will, he enjoined his heirs to add to his library, after his death, whatever they might deem worthy of note in natural, moral, political, philosophical, and religious science. He had indicated the sums which might be drawn from his estate for the fulfillment of this object, and charged his eldest son, Fulgence Adolphe, to proceed with these additions. Fulgence Adolphe accomplished with filial respect the wishes expressed by his illustrious father. After him, this huge library, which represented more than one child's share of the estate, remained undivided between the senator's three sons and two daughters, and René d'Esparvieux, on whom devolved the house in the Rue Garancier, became the guardian of the valuable collection. His two sisters, Madame Paulet de Saint-Fons and Madame Guissart, repeatedly demanded that such a large but unrenumerative piece of property should be turned into money, but René and Guéton bought in the shares of their two co-legatees, and the library was saved. René d'Esparvieux even busied himself in adding to it, thus fulfilling the intentions of its founder. But from year to year, he lessened the number and importance of the acquisitions, opining that the intellectual output in Europe was on the wane. Nevertheless, Guéton enriched it out of his funds with works published both in France and abroad, which he thought good, and he was not lacking in judgment, though his brothers would never allow that he had a particle. Thanks to this man of leisurely and inquiring mind, Baron Alexander's collection was kept practically up to date. Even at the present day, the Desparview Library in the departments of theology, jurisprudence, and history is one of the finest private libraries in all of Europe. Here you may study physical science, or to put it better, physical sciences in all their branches, and for that matter, metaphysic or metaphysics. That is to say, all that is connected with physics and has no other name. So impossible is it to designate by a substantive that which has no substance and is but a dream and an illusion. Here you may contemplate with admiration philosophers addressing themselves to the solution, dissolution, and resolution of the absolute, to the determination of the indeterminate, and to the definition of the infinite. Amid this pile of books and booklets, both sacred and profane, you may find everything down to the latest and most fashionable pragmatism. Other libraries there are, more richly abounding in bindings of venerable antiquity and illustrious origin, whose smooth and soft-hued texture render them delicious to the touch. Bindings which the gilder's art has enriched with gossamer, lacework, foliage, flowers, emblematic devices, and coats of arms, bindings that charm the studious eye with their tender radiance. Other libraries perhaps harbor a greater array of manuscripts illuminated with delicate and brilliant miniatures by artists of Venice, Flanders, or Touraine but in handsome, sound editions of ancient and modern writers, both sacred and profane. The Desparvieux Library is second to none. Here one finds all that has come down to us from antiquity, all the fathers of the church, the apologists and the decretalists, all the humanists of the Renaissance, all the encyclopedists, the world, the whole world of philosophy and science. 
Therefore, it was that Cardinal Merlin, when he deigned to visit it, remarked, There is no man whose brain is equal to containing all the knowledge which is piled upon these shelves. Happily, it doesn't matter. Monsignor Cachepot, who worked there often when a curate in Paris, was in the habit of saying, I see here the stuff to make many a Thomas Aquinas and many an Arius, if only the modern mind had not lost its ancient ardor for good and evil. There is no gainsaying that the manuscripts formed the more valuable portion of this immense collection. Noteworthy indeed was the unpublished correspondence of Gassendi, of Father Mersenne, and of Pascal, which threw a new light on the spirit of the 17th century. Nor must we forget the Hebrew Bibles, the Talmuds, and the rabbinical treatises, printed and in manuscript, the Aramaic and Samaritan texts on sheepskin and on tablets of sycamore. In fine, all these antiques and valuable copies collected in Egypt and in Syria by the celebrated Moish de Dina and acquired at a small cost by Alexandre d'Esparvieux in 1836 when the learned Hebraist died of old age and poverty in Paris. The Esparvienne Library occupied the whole of the second floor of the old house. The works thought to be of but mediocre interest, such as books of Protestant exegesis of the 19th and 20th centuries, the gift of Monsieur Gaetan, were relegated unbound to the limbo of the upper regions. The catalog, with its various supplements, ran into no less than 18 folio volumes. It was quite up to date, and the library was in perfect order. Monsieur Julien Sariette, archivist and paleographer, who, being poor and retiring, used to make his living by teaching, became, in 1895, tutor to young Maurice on the recommendation of the Bishop of Agra, and with scarcely an interval found himself curator of the Bibliothèque Esparvienne. Endowed with businesslike energy and dogged patience, Monsieur Sariette himself classified all the members of this vast body. The system he invented and put into practice was so complicated. The labels he put on the books were made up of so many capital letters and small letters, both Latin and Greek. So many Arabic and Roman numerals, asterisks, double asterisks, triple asterisks, and those signs which, in arithmetic, express powers and roots, that the mere study of it would have involved more time and labor than would have been required for the complete mastery of algebra. And, as no one could be found who would give the hours, that might be more profitably employed in discovering the law of numbers to the solving of these cryptic symbols. Monsieur Sariette remained the only one capable of finding his way among the intricacies of his system and without his help, it had become an utter impossibility to discover among the 360,000 volumes confided to his care, the particular volume one happened to require. Such was the result of his labors. Far from complaining about it, he experienced, on the contrary, a lively satisfaction. Monsieur Sariette loved his library. He loved it with a jealous love. He was there every day at seven o'clock in the morning, busy cataloging at a huge mahogany desk. The slips in his handwriting filled an enormous case standing by his side, surmounted by a plaster bust of Alexandre de Asparvieux. Alexander wore his hair brushed straight back and had a sublime look on his face. Like Chateaubriand, he affected little feathery side whiskers. His lips were pursed, his bosom bare. Punctually at midday, Monsieur Sariette used to sally forth to lunch at a cremerie in the narrow, gloomy Rue de Cornette. It was known as the Crémerie des Quatre Évêques and had once been the haunt of Baudelaire, Theodore de Bonville, Charles Asselineau, and a certain grande of Spain who had translated the mysteries of Paris into the language of the conquistadors. And the ducks that paddled so nicely on the old stone sign which gave its name to the street used to recognize Monsieur Sariette. 
At a quarter to one, to the very minute, he went back to his library, where he remained until seven o'clock. He then again betook himself to the Quatre Eveque and sat down to his frugal dinner with its crowning glory of stewed prunes. Every evening after dinner, his crony, Monsieur Guinardon, universally known as Pere Guinardon, a scene painter and picture restorer who used to do work for churches, would come down from his garret in the Rue Princesse to have his coffee and liquor at the Quatre Eveque, and the two friends would play their games of dominoes. Old Guinardon, who was like some rugged old tree still full of sap, was older than he could bring himself to believe. He had known Chenevard. His chastity was positively ferocious, and he was forever denouncing the impurities of neo-paganism in language of alarming obscenity. He loved talking. Monsieur Sariette was a ready listener. Old Guinardon's favorite subject was the Chapelle des Anges in Saint-Sulpice in which the paintings were peeling off the walls and which he was one day to restore. When, that is, it should please God. For, since the separation, the churches belonged solely to God and no one would undertake the responsibility of even the most urgent repairs. But old Guinardon demanded no salary. Michael is my patron saint, he said, and I have a special devotion for the holy angels. After they had had their game of dominoes, Monsieur Sariette, very thin and small, and old Guinardon, sturdy as an oak, hirsute as a lion, and tall as a Saint Christopher, went off chatting away side by side across the place sans sulpice, heedless of whether the night were fine or stormy. Monsieur Sariette always went straight home, much to the regret of the painter, who was a gossip and a nightbird. The following day, as the clock struck seven, Monsieur Sariette would take up his place in the library and resume his cataloging. As he sat at his desk, however, he would dart a Medusa-like look at anyone who entered, fearing lest he should prove to be a book borrower. It was not merely the magistrates, politicians, and prelates whom he would have liked to turn to stone when they came to ask for the loan of a book with an air of authority, bred of their familiarity with the master of the house. He would have done as much to Monsieur Gaetan, the library's benefactor, when he wanted some gay or scandalous old volume wherewith to beguile a wet day in the country. He would have meted out similar treatment to Madame René d'Esparvieu when she came to look for a book to read to her sick poor in hospital and even to Monsieur René d'Esparvieu himself, who generally contented himself with the civil code and a volume of Dalos. The borrowing of the smallest book seemed like dragging his heart out to refuse a volume even to such as had the most incontestable right to it. Monsieur Sariette would invent countless far-fetched or clumsy fibs, and did not even shrink from slandering himself as curator, or from casting doubts on his own vigilance, by saying that such and such a book was mislaid or lost, when a moment ago he had been gloating over that very volume, or pressing it to his bosom. And when ultimately faced to part with a volume, he would take it back a score of times from the borrower, before he finally relinquished it. He was always in agony, lest one of the objects confided to his care should escape him. As the guardian of 360,000 volumes, he had 360,000 reasons for alarm. Sometimes he woke at night bathed in sweat and uttering a cry of fear because he had dreamed he had seen a gap on one of the shelves of his bookcases. It seemed to him a monstrous, unheard of, and most grievous thing that a volume should leave its habitat. This noble rapacity exasperated Monsieur René d'Esparvieux, who, failing to understand the good qualities of his paragon of a librarian, called him an old maniac. Monsieur Sariette knew naught of this injustice, but he would have braved the cruelest misfortune and endured opprobrium and insult to safeguard the integrity of his trust. 
thanks to his assiduity, his vigilance and zeal, or, in a word, to his love. The Esparvien Library had not lost so much as a single leaflet under his supervision during the 16 years which had now rolled by. This 9th of September, 1912. This concludes Chapter 2 of The Revolt of the Angels by Anatole France. I'm Phil Zio, and please continue listening to the playlist for the next chapter and many beyond.